right, without the nose. And uh, <coughs> it's a truly pleasure to have uh, Dr. Elias uh, Illinois. Billions. Billions. <laughs> we have our seminar here this afternoon, and uh, he received his special degree in applied mathematics from the National Technical University license in 2008. And then he came to the US and uh, studied his PhD. So he received his PhD degree also in applied mathematics from Cornell University in 2013. And afterwards, he started his postdoc career at the Argo National Lab. And after he finished his uh, Postdoc training, he joined the University, Purdue University, in the School of Mechanical Engineering as an assistant professor. And right now, he's leading the predictive science laboratory. His research focuses on uncertainty quantification, design optimization under uncertainties, model calibration, and uh, social technical modeling. Right? Sorry. And in today's talk, he will talk about the uncertainty quantification by using the embarrassing these small numbers of simulation and experiments. So let's welcome him. Thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's a little bit strange because I'm a mathematician uh, working in the mechanical engineering department, so it is strange, I admit it. Um, and, and, but to my defense, my PhD advisor was a mechanical engineer. So I grew up with mechanical engineers, so I picked something from them in terms of uh, problem solving, right? So I stopped doing so much theoretical work, I actually tried to collaborate with my uh, uh, colleagues to solve our problems. Now, uh, this talk used to be too mathematical. I gave this talk, I, I used to give this talk to mostly math audiences that are familiar with uncertainty quantification. And I actually tried to use it last week in, an in front of an engineering audience. Uh, and halfway through the talk, I realized that nobody had no clue about what I was talking about. <laughs> so, so I decided to take uh, off all the equations, almost all the equations, uh, and focus on the problems. But to do that, I, I had to uh, include... Uh, a longer introduction to what the problem is, all right, with pictures and all that. So if you're familiar with uncertainty quantification and uncertainty propagation and problems in general, please be patient. I uh, will get to the juice somewhere in the middle of the talk. Okay. All right, so what is uncertainty quantification and why is it needed? According to Wikipedia, uncertainty quantification is the science of quantitative characterization and reduction of uncertainties in applications. All right, I, I had to look and read this because I don't really remember it. So it's basically dealing with unknown things in your model. Uh, that's a certification. How do you deal with things that you don't really know? Either because they're truly random or because you cannot measure them accurately. Uh, or because you don't know. All right, some examples. Uh, from structure liability. So imagine that you have a building. And uh, this building, let's say that is in a lay in a lay effort can happen, all right? So if uh, an earthquake hits, let's say, your building, your building is going to vibrate, and you're interested in figuring out what is the probability that the maximum drift you observe along the floors of the, of the building exceeds a critical level that will cause damage, all right? So that thing would be called here, is, is called the fragility curve of a building. And it's basically the probability that something bad happens conditional on the magnitude of the earthquake. Now, if you want to calculate this probability, you want to estimate it, you're going to need a high fidelity simulation of the building. Right? And if it is a really high fidelity simulation of the building, it's going to take a while to run a single simulation, perhaps, let's say, five hours for the sake of it. And what you're going to have to do is generate many random earthquakes, probably. Uh, Simulate your model on these earthquakes and then basically use a Monte Carlo estimator to find uh, this, this probability of interest. Right? You just count the amount of times that uh, the drift exceeds the critical value. Now you see here two problems. First, how do I quantify the uncertainty of the earthquake? Right? That would be the uncertainty uh, quantification problem. The second problem is how do I propagate this uncertainty through 
a simulation model to get to a quantity of interest. Of course, you may say that's trivial. Generate death quicks, evaluate the model, look at what you get, do it a million times, and you're done. So my problem is, what if you can't do it a million times? What if you can't do it ten times? Let me give you another example. Uh, this comes from uh, oil reservoir modeling, and uh, in particular, the optimization of where you drill. So in secondary oil production, what you basically do is you drill two wells, through at least two wells. Through one well, you pump water. The water goes through the porous rock, and it pushes oil out of the other well. All right? And the problem is, where do you drill? Where do you drill? The uncertainty here comes from the fact that you don't really know where the oil is trapped. You don't know the, the porosity of the ground. You don't know the permeability of the ground. You don't know how the ground looks like. The only way you can figure out how the ground looks like would be to drill, take a piece out, and measure the permeability. Or you can uh, hit the ground with something, perhaps dynamite, measure the acoustic response, and try to figure out how the ground looks like. Anyway, if you come up with a stochastic model of how the ground looks like, you can use a, a computational fluid dynamics to figure out how much oil you're going to get out of the well. Now, of course, if you don't know how the ground looks like, you don't know exactly what is going to be the production history you're going to observe. All right? And the problem here would be to optimize the locations of the well so that you somehow maximize the expected oil you can get out of it, and perhaps minimize the variance of that production. This is another example uh, of uncertainty quantification and propagation. It comes from uh, uh, numerical weather prediction. So you can, uh, you, you can take, uh, say, again, it's, it's computational fluid dynamics. So you write down equations that describe the atmosphere, pressure, temperature, velocity fields, and all that. All right? Pretty, complicated equations with thermodynamics in them and all that. And you have to somehow initialize these equations. You have to provide the initial conditions so that you solve them. Of course, how do you know? How can you initialize a model that includes the whole there? You cannot do that. Okay? So you, can all, you have to rely on, on the weather stations that are finite, all right? which means that in between you're going to have to interpolate <laughs> And, of course, you cannot be sure about your interpolation. You have to quantify this uncertainty in the initial conditions. All right? Now, once you can quantify this uncertainty in the initial conditions, you can use it to talk about the uncertainty of things like the path of a hurricane or the probability of rain, I guess, what is of most interest to us, or the probability of a flight cancellation if you want to take these probabilities and through all right? So here again you see two things that characterize my work. One is how do you quantify uncertainties in things that are really high dimensional, like fields. Right? That's one thing about which I'm not going to talk. But I can talk offline about that. And the second thing is how do you take these quantified uncertainties and propagate them through models that are computationally expensive. So it's fine. If you can do a million simulations, there's no problem. You're going to be able to get this nice looking uh, fat path for, for the center of, of, of the hurricane. Right? That's fine. If you can do a million, so be it. But what if you can do 10? How can you then do, stati how can you do statistics with 10 simulations? And that's what I'm going to do. All right. Uh, now, what kinds of uncertainties are there and how uh, are we going to model them? I talked about it a little bit uh, in the course of introducing uh, the generic problems, but let me do it once more. So, we're going to have aleatorian uncertainties, which are uncertainties that are really reducible uh, in the sense that there's nothing you can do about them, it's just there. Okay? And there are epistemic uncertainties, which are uncertainties due to lack of knowledge. Well, if you are willing to pay the price, if you can measure a little bit more, if you can simulate a little bit more, if you can do a little bit more research to figure out you know, something more about you know, what you're studying, perhaps you can eliminate these uncertainties. So 
Uh, we're going to be focusing mostly on these guys, but uh, the extended outside of this, but let me give you a few examples to, to see what I'm, I'm talking about. And actually, I'm going to ask you, is it on the Adorno or the so that you don't sleep? All right, so a new microstructure of a manufactured artifact. Here you have a bevel gear, and uh, you know every time you, you make it, the microstructure, I mean, the properties, at least the properties of the microstructure are the same. If you use the same one you've seen, the same uh, raw material, you're probably going to get the same distributions. But if you look at the different gears at the same spot, you'll see a different microstructure. All right? But the microstructure is not a random. It is something very specific. You just don't know what it is. Every time you, you get a, a new bevel gear, it's slightly different. And you don't know what it is. And the only way to know what it is is to take the gear, break it in thin pieces, and put it in an electric uh, scanning uh, microscope and see it. That's the only way. So is this uncertainty a total or just saying? It is a percent. It is reducible with the electron scanning microscope, but it's too ridiculous to be. Uh, this is the example with the, uh, with, with, with the permeability of the ground. So, uh, the permeability of the ground is, a, is a, something that is not random, it is very specific. But to measure it, you're going to have to drill and take out the pieces and look at them, pass fluids through them and measure the permeability, or hit the ground and use acoustic uh, inversion to, seismic inversion to, to figure out what it is. Again, this is also an example of epistemics. Right? Now, this is another example of epistemic uncertainty. So, uh, statistical mechanics, you're usually uh, basically trying to sample, let's say, the Boltzmann distribution of the canonical ensemble, and you have this guy here, the potential energy of your configuration, and this, ideally, you want to get it from first principles, but first principles are not really, uh, this stage, at least, really first principles, so there's a little bit of uncertainty in what this potential uh, really is. And of course, if this is a coarse grain system, then there is additional uncertainty about what that potential is. Right? So for example, think of the Leonard Jones potential. What is sigma? What is epsilon? Take another potential. What are, the parameters? what are the parameters of this potential? So here you see another thing. If you see the same thing. We have a, a stochastic model about which we are uncertain. It's kind of double stochasticity. And of course, this uncertainty is also epistemic uncertainty. Epistemic in the sense that perhaps if you really sit down and you do quantum mechanical calculation using the best exchange, exchange correlation function, maybe you, you name it. You name it okay? Perhaps if you do enough experiments, maybe you can find it. But unless you're willing to pay the price, you are uncertain about it. All right, cosmic microwave background. Radiation. The radiation that is left from the Big Bang is that aleatory or epistemic uncertainty? It's probably an As This is the closest I could find to aleatory. I have, I have a really hard time with aleatory uncertainties. With irreducible, truly uncertain things, truly random things, I have a really hard time with them because if you really think deeply about most of the problems, they turn out to be epistemic. This one is the closest I, I could find to truly aleatory uncertainty. Now, of course, you can observe it if you take one of these uh, old televisions and you turn it on to a random channel, you'll see the snow. The snow is the cosmic background. Now, another thing that is probably truly aleatory uncertainty is uh, it has purely aleatory uncertainty is quantum mechanics. Now, according to the most uh, uh, Commonly accepted, to the accepted interpretation of uh, quantum mechanics, the, the, the electron is a, does truly random things. So if you throw it to, uh, to, to, uh, to two holes, it will either go, not either go through one or the other. We don't really understand what it does, but it's truly, truly random. Okay? And that's also that's the, that's the second closest thing I could think of. Uh, I could come up with uh, an aleatory uh, answer to the example. Now, I don't know, perhaps, 
Perhaps somebody can think of a model that repeats the same things that does include aleatorial uncertainty. I don't know. I wouldn't get that far. What about turbulence? Is turbulence epistemic or is it aleatorial? Some would say it's epistemic. If you discuta, if you really, if you take a really, really, really fine mess for your computational fluid dynamics, perhaps you 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 will get a true deterministic thing. All right? Perhaps you will can exactly predict what happens to its. Uh, so let's say let's take every every uh, every water molecule, every water, every air molecule, and do MD. Yes, perhaps you can track it exactly. Okay. So in that sense, it is epistemic, but it is ridiculous to think of it as epistemic because the resolution you need is so much that it's really impossible to do it. So it could also be as an authority. Where do I want to get? Who cares about aleatory or epistemic uncertainties? They are uncertainties, okay? And we're going to treat them in exactly the same way and the right way of treating uncertainties is to use probability theory. That's the right way of treating uncertainty. So we're not going to care if something is aleatory or epistemic. We're going to say things like, well, uh, we're going to assign to, to stuff, to, to quantities of interest, probabilities that tell us how much we believe that certain things are true given all the knowledge we have at a given point in time. That's what we're going to do. That's the interpretation we're going to. That's how we're going to model uncertainties with probability. With probability theory, we don't really care whether or not the underlying uncertainties are aleatory or epistemic. This is a philosophical question. Anyway, the best reference for probability theory and the one that I have my students read is probability theory: the logic of science uh, by E.T. James, the father of uh, the Marxian logic. It's a very fun one, so it's very good. All right, so ideally, we will want to be able to say things like that. What is the probability that we see a, a specific uh, microstructure? And not only that, I mean, we actually have to come up with a parameterization of this thing. We have to come up with this probability density, with the probability density of the microstructure. We need to be able to sample from that thing. And of course, the only thing that we have to come up with this is data. This is the uncertainty quantification problem, or the density estimation problem. It's a very, it's a very important problem in uncertainty quantification, obviously, right? And it is very difficult because of the high dimensionality of, of the objects. Again, I told you, I'm not going to really talk about that. But this is all in the background. Okay, we just have all these things in mind. All right, density estimation. What are the UQ problems I am going to talk about? And I really hope I don't spend all my time talking about what I'm not going to talk about. <laughs> all right, so UQ problems and their challenges. Uh, let's uh, do a little bit of uh, generalization. So we have, we're going to have a physical model or an experiment. It's going to have input parameters. Sometimes I'm going to call them control parameters if it's an experiment. And uh, if you... Uh, evaluate the physical model on these input parameters, we're going to get some values of interest. I'm going to be calling the input x, the model f, the output quantities of interest y, and you can think of the whole thing, you can think of a model, of any model you have as a function that takes some inputs about which perhaps you're uncertain and gives you some outputs about which you want to argue or optimize or do whatever with that. Okay. So we'll replace all the complicated stuff with an f. Some of the UQ problems. Uncertain propagation, we talked about that. You, uh, you come up with a probability distribution for the input of the model, and your goal is to estimate the uncertainty, the induced uncertainty, the output of the model. Yes? So, aren't the functions really a dynamical system in which case then you have to take it over a period Yes, so think of f as, uh, or y as anything you, you, you're interested in, which could be a function of time. Right, so any 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 output of your model, your out, the output of your model could be a time series. I'm fine with that. Okay, it could be as complicated as, as you want. It could be a picture. It could be a probability density. It could be anything. I'm just going to call it y. All right. 
Uh, and I'm interested in assignment propagation. So if you uh, assign a distribution on the input, what is the induced distribution of the output? That's the classical assignment propagation problem, which you pretty much, all, 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 all of you that work on computational stuff should have finished at some point. The other important problem is model calibration, which is the inverse of assignment propagation. You measure experimentally why, and you want to go back and characterize and update your uncertainty about x. Whenever you talk about this problem, this uh, is a, a classic, very difficult problem. I'll give you some references. But if you're interested in learning more about this problem, I, I can do it uh, offline. Now, design optimization under uncertainty, I'm sure that this is the most important problem of all. And this has to do with the following thing. So instead of uh, just propagating uncertainties or just calibrating things, you want to actively design your system in order to maximize certain objectives. And you have one, you have more, and typically you want to maximize some expected objective, right? So this problem actually hides in it an uncertainty quantification problem. First, you have to quantify the uncertainty about everything you don't know. And secondly, it hides in it an uncertainty propagation problem. So for its design, you have to propagate uncertainties. And then you have to take all that and do it many times in order to solve a hard optimization problem. So these are the three basic problems. I'm going to focus on this one and on this one. And now that I'm thinking about it, I should probably skip one. Unless you want to stay here for uh, one and a half hours. One half. <laughs> All right, so yes, you're right. If you think about it, Monte Carlo methods are the simplest way to solve Uncertain quantification problems. Any uncertain quantification problem can be solved with Monte Carlo. You're absolutely right. If it wasn't for the fact that Monte Carlo is fundamentally unsound, in the sense that it ignores correlations between the inputs and the outputs that you can actually learn if you look at them. All right. So yes, you can randomly sample x's and probably and look at the y's. Uh, but if you sample X's and you evaluate the Y, you can actually try to look at them and try to learn the relationship between X and Y, and then at some point stop sampling. Learn from the data you collect. There's more in the data you collect in Monte Carlo than Monte Carlo uses. That's why Monte Carlo is fundamentally not sound. And of course, it's not applicable because it typically needs a lot of samples to give you convergent statistics. It is typically not applicable in complex problems. All right, that's why many of us, I mean, not me because that's my job, but many of the practitioners have a very complicated model which they run five times and they write a paper and they report uh, perhaps the best result. Okay, <laughs> uh, I'm just saying this is a very common practice, right? Uh, so that's because Monte Carlo is, is, is hard to deal with. All right, so there's the, the surrogate idea that tries to, to go over the, um, th this, uh, this problem with Monte Carlo, the fact that it ignores stuff that you can learn. And it goes as follows. Do a finite number of simulations, replace the model, the actual model you have, F, with an approximation. That approximation, which we're going to call a meta model or a surrogate could be perhaps an expansion in a polynomial basis, an expansion in a Fourier basis, or in any other, any other type of uh, fitting model. Okay? So do the finite number of simulations and fit the relationship between x and y. And then whatever you want to do with the real thing, do it with the side. That's the side of the idea. That's, that's what is on the backbone of every single certification method that you're going to find in the literature. Okay, that's it boils down to just that. All right, and that's good. That's okay when you can actually build an accurate response surface. That is absolutely fine. That's exactly what you should do. But there are some problems with building accurate response surfaces. One has to do with the high dimensionality of the inputs. If the inputs are high dimensional, it's very hard to build accurate response surfaces. And the other thing is that, depending on the problem, and depending again on the dimensionality, this is very related to the dimensionality of the input, you may need to run a lot of simulations or a lot of experiments to build something like it. Because remember, if it is inaccurate, garbage in, garbage out. Okay? It doesn't matter that you made it cheaper, you will be wrong. 
So, and there are also other problems I'm not going to talk about. I'm going to focus on this. This is a problem I'm going to focus on. It means a lot of simulation. What do you do with that? All right, so this is the idea. Limited simulations and experiments increase epistemic uncertainty. Now, you don't only have the uncertainty that was originally your problem by saying that, look, I can only afford to run my simulations five times. You're actually inducing additional uncertainty. You're now uncertain about your model. All right? It doesn't matter that your model is deterministic. It doesn't matter that you know all the math. If you can evaluate it five times, it is as good as doing an experiment. Okay? It's doing a real experiment. So I'm going to, what I'm going to do in this talk from this point on, and that's the actual topic of the talk. I usually start here. Okay? I hope, I hope you do this, Cliff. Really. Uh, so, the actual topic of the talk is how to quantify this epistemic uncertainty, the uncertainty used by the limited number of uh, simulations, and how to exploit it to actively select simulations, to select the simulations for the experiment that's going to, going to give you the maximum amount of information for whatever it is that you want to learn. All right, so how do we quantify epistemic uncertainties due to limited observations? The answer is, Bayes theorem, or Bayes rule, because it's really a rule, it's not a theorem. You just have to be Bayesian. Right? You just assign probabilities to everything, you observe data, and you just nicely use Bayes rule to condition all that data and get posteriors, and you just make sure you only use the roots of probability, nothing else. You don't have to invent anything. Just use probability uh, theory roots all the way through until the end. At some point, you're going to have to do a little bit of math. That is fine. That's where you come to me and we collaborate, perhaps you pay me something and I do it, right? <laughs> Alright, so the Bayesian approach. The Bayesian approach goes as follows. This is the evolutionary idea. Which is a little hard to understand at first. A little bit strange, I would say. You put a probability measure on the space of models. So you say, now, I can only observe my model a finite number of times. So it is, as if, it is as if I don't know what my model really is, unless I actually evaluate it. So I go there, I'm now uncertain about a function, and I go to that function space, and I put a probability of that function space. Is it strange? It's a little bit strange, but it's the same as going to a parameter space and putting a probability. Now your model is like an unknown parameter. Now, if you evaluate the actual model on a finite uh, number of points, you use Bayes' rule to get a posterior on the space of models, and then you harness that extended uncertainty in the posterior to, to solve any new problem you want with quantified extended uncertainty. I will show you how this looks like in a while. Now, this is one of the first... Actually, the first guy that talked about this process was uh, Laplace, the guy who invented probability. Uh, we forgot about it for a while because statisticians didn't really like uh, Bayesian uh, inference. Uh, so it was revived again in the late 80s by this guy, Percy Diaconis, uh, who's a statistics uh, professor at uh, Stanford. There's an interesting story about the revival of uh, Bayesian statistics and specifically its application to engineering and physics which we're going to discuss offline. All right, so here's the idea. Here's the space of functions, the space of your models. So, for example, your molecular dynamics model is a point in that space. The model, your fine dynamic model is a point in that space. So let's assume now that uh, we're actually looking at models that are from one variable to one variable so that we can visualize them. So how would the prior on the function space would look like? It would look like this. I mean, that's the best way I can visualize. Now, now I'm going to that function space and I'm drawing random samples. I'm drawing a random sample and I have a path and I move on that path. I take another random sample and I move on that path. And I show you just possibilities for your model. So before you see anything about your model, before you see anything, you go to the, the function space, you put a probability measure, and that's your state of knowledge before you do any simulations. Then you start doing simulations and you use base rule to condition the original probability, the, the original probability measure, so that the functions it gives you go through 
the simulations you have done. So here, for example, you have done a simulation, you know, you simulate that this x and you observe that y, so all the possible functions better go through that x and y. You have also done this simulation right here, x and y, so all the functions better go through there. So it's basically as if you go here and you grab all these random functions so that they go through it all. All right? There's a little bit of math involved here. Okay, so what I what use for this particular visualization is Gaussian gotcha processes, but it's fair game, anything else is fair game. So this thing here that you see, right, the fact that the functions in between the actual observations do whatever they want uh, is the epistemic uncertainty used by the limited number of simulations. If you do more, this uncertainty would go away. All right. So this uncertainty, you can actually, I'm going to go through this a little bit faster so that I'll show you something else. But you can harness this uncertainty to do uncertainty, pro to, to, uh, do uncertainty propagation with limited data. So uh, let's say you, you add a, a random uh, distribution on the input of the function, and you can now use this whole thing, which is an ensemble of possible models, to talk about the variance, let's say, of your response. And, all, and the, the, the estimate you get for the variance is no longer a point estimate. It's a distribution. And you see here is the epistemic uncertainty that you have about the variance, that is about the integral, of the, some kind of integral of the square of that function. Because you have not observed that function everywhere. Anyway, I basically did my PhD on just this problem. <laughs> All right? So uh, what is the take home message? If you want to do uncertainty propagation seriously on a model that is very, very expensive, there is a way to do it. There is a way to do it. And the way to do it would be to be fully Bayesian. And perhaps the best uh, reference to my work would be this book chapter right here that describes a little bit more mathematical form what uh, I just talked about. All right, so, but what we really want to do is uh, design. We want to do optimization, to optimize that. So, let's talk about this uh, design problem. We have a, a wire drawing process. The inputs of the wire drawing process are basically the induction ratios and the die angles. All right, so you pass a wire through a die, a die and you can select the uh, die angle right here, the reduction ratio, and you basically want to get a wire that is as strong as possible and has specific uh, specifications. All right, so the reduction ratio is that the die angles are the process controls, and then you pass it once, you pass it twice, you pass it in this particular uh, problem, um, which, which is a collaboration with Tata, we pass it eight times. Okay, there is uncertainty involved here, there is uncertainty in the die angle. No matter how, uh, how uh, careful you are, you're going to get uncertainty in the die angle. You're going to get uncertainty in the reduction ratio. You cannot make these things perfectly. And uh, you can then measure the output of interest, which here will be the strain on uniform factor and the ultimate uh, tensile strength. And you want to, we're going to call these guys X. This thing you can call it Xi. So this is now the design or the control of the process. That would be the random stuff. Uh, we have a finite element simulator of a process that takes a while to run. And we observe the outputs y1, which is what we want to maximize, and y2, which is what we want to minimize. So this thing is really a multi-objective optimization problem in which for each x, if you want to evaluate the objectives, you need to solve an uncertainty propagation problem. So it looks like that. I mean, we can put a minus sign in the minimization objective and turn it to a maximization objective. So it will be maximize the expectation of two things over everything that is random. And what we really want to get is the Pareto frontier, which is the set of non-dominated designs, the designs that are optimal, the designs that give you objectives uh, so that if you try to uh, maximize something further, you will necessarily reduce the other objective. Right, so that's the, what the part of the problem is like. So the question now, 
Of course, if you are familiar with multi object optimization, you will tell me I'm going to use an edit algorithm. I will just sample the hell out of it. I will sample it a thousand times. I will find out what the Pareto stuff. But what if you want to find the Pareto front with 20 simulations? What is the best thing you can say about the Pareto front with 20 simulations? All right, this is where our methodologies come uh, in handy. So here you see the outputs of these 20 simulations, these diamonds, and uh, using these techniques about which I'm not really talking about because there's a little bit of math that I'll have to explain, which I'm trying to avoid. You can get things like the best prediction of the Pareto front, given the data you have right now, which would be the red line. It's actually the median of the a random set. Uh, and you can get also epistemic uncertainty about the Pareto front. So now that you cannot really say that the Pareto front is this line. It could be any point here in this fat gray region could be a point of the Pareto front. That's epistemic uncertainty. And we have a lot of work uh, on, on this topic. There's one published work that uh, may be of interest to you if you want to optimize something under uncertainty. You cannot evaluate that something a lot of times. That will be the work to look at. And now we're preparing uh, two publications on multi object optimization under uncertainty. One has to do with simulations, the other has to do with experiments. And I will show you. A few more about that in a while. All right. So now we will get to the important thing. How do we select which simulation or experiment to run next? And the answer is epistemic uncertainty. Let's use the epistemic uncertainty to select the new simulation. I'll give you two ideas. And these are two generic ideas. They're, they're not applicable to just one problem. They're applicable to any problem as soon as you hire a postdoc and you pay him for here for three years to figure out the details. All right? But in principle, they're applicable to anything. Before I give you these ideas, I give you the simplistic idea. All right, we have epistemic uncertainty. Let's just select the simulation about which we're maximally uncertain. That is absolutely fine. This is okay. You can do that. All right? But what you're going to achieve with that is learn the response surface. If that is your goal, this is the optimal thing to do. If your goal is to just get a better idea, the best idea possible about your model, you should just select a simulation about which you're much more uncertain. There's no problem. But it's not universally optimal. If there's something else that you need to do, if, if for example, you want to learn more about the maximum of health or the minimum of your response, or uh, the probability of a rare event, then this is not optimal. You're wasting simulations. All right, so I'm going to pose this question. What if we want to learn more about something specific, another quantity of interest, let's say Q, where Q could be the expectation or the variance statistic of your output, or uh, the calibrated model parameters, or the optimal design, or the control, or the optimal value of uh, an optimization problem? What if you want to learn more about Q? Okay, here's the answer. Here's the generic answer that applies to everything with some significant effort for actually doing uh, So here's how it goes. Collect data in order to maximize the expected information gain about Q. Okay, big deal. Right? So you, of course we want to do that. Yeah. Yeah, it's that simple. But there's a little bit of math involved, right? So the expected information gain is a very well-defined mathematical term, which I'm going to show you now what it is. Okay? It will appear somewhere here. So it's going to be a, it's going to be a formula. Okay? So it's something very specific. It's not just words. So here is the quantity of interest Q. And uh, here's what, with the current data that we have seen so far, with the current set of simulation and experiments, let's say that this probability density represents what we currently think that Q is. Okay? And then we do, a hype, uh, we, we do a hypothetical simulation. We say, what if we go to, sim to, to input X and we see and we do the simulation and we see Y? What if that happens? What if you run an experiment 
at control X and you observe Y. How would that change your state of knowledge about Q? And let's say, of course, that your state of knowledge about Q is going to be improved in the sense that the distribution you get for Q is going to shrink a little bit. So you have learned something about Q. Now, the difference or the distance between these two distributions is the information gained. How much information you have gained by observing X and Y. Now, there's a problem, however. You don't really know, you don't really observe Y. You don't observe the output. Unless you actually go and do the simulation, and then there's no point talking about information gain because you have already done the simulation. All right, so you can quantify the information gain of a hypothetical simulation, but then you need to average over what the simulation may give you. So we quantify the information gain, and then we use our epistemic uncertainty to average out the possible outcomes of our simulations or of our experiments. And that's the turns out to be like that. It looks like that. So the information gain between two distributions is actually this guy. It's called the pullback library divergence, or a relative entry. So if you're familiar with statistical mechanics, this thing appears over and over again, but we don't call it pullback library divergence. We call it relative entry. Uh, and it looks like that. Distance between your state of knowledge before and after observing X and Y and integrating over what Y can be. That is the expected information gain. General idea number two. I give two ideas. General idea number two. Collect data in order to maximize the expected value of information. This is borrowed from, uh, from economics. So if, if you can actually measure the value of what you're doing, then uh, and the cost and uh, the cost of your experiments or simulation, then you could use this idea instead of the expected information gain. So you ask, how much value have we obtained so far from our experiments? Let's say we have obtained this value, subtract from it the cost of doing the experiments. That's what we have gained so far in terms of dollars or time or whatever it is you're interested in. And how much additional value would we get if a text, if we simulate that text and we observe Y? And that is, of course, the value you get from all the data you gather minus the cost of doing the new simulation. Okay, and this is like the marginal value. It's the difference in value, the increasing value by simulating that X. But of course, you don't know what Y is, you don't know what the output is, so you have to integrate it all, integrate it all. So what you get now, it's another information acquisition function that gives you the amount of, the, the value of doing the simulation, the value of doing an experiment. All right, so here's the generic approach. The, the, the first heuristic that I'm going to introduce, simply do the simulation, do the experiment that maximizes the information acquisition function, which would be the expected information gain or the value of information. It is a heuristic in the sense that the real problem is actually to find an information acquisition policy that maximizes the overall expected information gain or the overall value. And that is a very hard dynamic programming problem. It's impossible to solve, but you can... Uh, Find a PhD, you, you, can, you can do a PhD thesis on just an approximation. All right, so here's how it goes, and I will basically stop here because I'm going over time. Is it 45 minutes? Should I say 45 minutes? Over off? I know. It's, uh, it's okay. I, no, it's <laughs> never okay. I know. So although if, I, if I want you guys to shake me, I, I should go on for another half hour. So, so I, will, I, will, I, will stop, I will stop right after this time. So, to wrap it up, right? You have you do a little of, you do some simulation, and some experiments. Use Bayes' rule to quantify your state of knowledge about your simulation or your experiment, given the data you have seen so far. Then uh, this state of knowledge you can you, you can propagate it to to get the state of knowledge of any quantity of interest that is derived from your model, like optima probabilities of their events, statistics, anything. Now, if the epistemic uncertainty that you get for these quantities of interest is small enough, 
Fine, write the paper. Report the result. Okay? If it is not, then select, you need to do more simulations, you need to do more experiments, select the simulations of experiments that maximize the expected information gain or the value of information. Do these simulations and experiments, put them back in your data set and repeat until you're either satisfied or your, resource, your resources have been depleted. Okay, that's the, that's the idea. All right, and uh, seriously, I'm going to move to the thank you slide and stop here, okay? So, uh, to do what is the question? Like, what do you want to do with this data? To improve the prediction. Improve the, 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 the your model. So, the, the prediction of the model in these things. So, what I'm trying to understand is it's a classical problem. You know, like now, uh, someone can go down to, uh, to improve a little bit the. Uh, this has to do with scales. But if it is like fundamentally random, uh, Yes, it will be the same approach. Now, if you, okay, so this is a very good point. So it, it's, uh, it goes like that. Okay, so you have an F, you have been showing us an F here that is basically like a number, right? But perhaps my F is a distribution. So when you do an MD, you're getting distributions of stuff uh, or expectations of stuff. So your model is actually stochastic. This is absolutely fine. We can deal with it. If we turn your probabilistic model and we summarize it with a bunch of numbers, right? So instead of saying uh, my model predicts, uh, I don't know, it's a quantum mechanical model that gives me the wave functions. Okay, wave functions is way too complicated. I can treat it as a y, but perhaps I want to look at the probability of transitioning from this state to the other, to the other or to the ground state energy. You know, take it down to a bunch of numbers. Be a hundred numbers, that's fine. Uh, and then you can apply these things. Yes, I have a uh, have, you ever, uh, have you ever tried to apply this technique into uh, some form of model discrimination? So you have multiple models and you try to determine which one is a better match? This is, a, this is also very good. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is an open problem. So, in principle, if you are Bayesian, if you are Bayesian, you can ask the question, which, which one of these models is the best match to the data I have? Right? So this is, this, this is called Bayesian model selection. So, and, and then what, so that would be, this problem is solved by Bayes' rule itself. So it gives you a probability over, the, over its model, probability over its model being the true one. Now, if you want to collect data, to discriminate between these models in the optimal way, right? If that is if that is the question, this is something that nobody has done, at least to my knowledge, at least in engineering. Uh, it's a very very interesting problem. Uh, so how do you collect data to discriminate between different models? Yes, you could use uh, you could use the same techniques. You could say I want to maximize the expected information gain about the posterior over the possible models. That's why I'm saying these, these ideas are generic enough to apply everywhere, but they're so generic that they need three years of work to actually do something. Okay? But that's fine, because that's how you get it. Yes? So Then I get a y. Um, so I can write the variance of y, the 
first order derivative of f with respect to the input variable x squared times the variance of the input variable x squared. Mm -hmm. So this is the first order approximation which I can then put in the minimization of uh, expected value and variance, let's say, and then I have to solve it that way. Yes. So as I've done before, this is first first order sensitivity analysis. Yes. That's okay. If you if you know, but you need the derivative of the function, right? right? Okay. So if you have that, go ahead. Okay. Fine. Use it. But what if your function is an experiment? So in this example, which I didn't show you, my function goes as follows. So there is a person specifying the parameters of operation of a chemical vapor deposition reactor by hand. Taking uh, this graphene grown on, on, on a copper substrate, then a person takes the graphene, does the Raman spectroscopy on it, does the data analysis of the Raman spectrum, and gives me two numbers that indicate the quality of the graphene. How do you differentiate that with respect to the gas conditions, uh, the, the, the gas, the, the gas uh, concentrations and the pressure? Right? So, but I agree with you, right? If you have a, say, a model of, find an element model of a structure, you can use a method of adjoints to get derivatives of it. In your slide, step three, you use two definitions. You say maximize the expected information, and then you say maximize the value of expected information. What is Yes. So the the uh, expected information gain looks at the distance between my st my state of knowledge before and after a hypothetical simulation or experiment. Average over the result of the experiment. So it has to do with the distance in my state of knowledge. And my state of knowledge, because I'm Bayesian, it's a dis it's a distribution over the quantity of interest. The second thing is the value information comes from economics. Uh, and it has to do with the amount of money actually that I'm expecting to get out of an experiment. Which, of course, it, 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 it depends on how you measure value for whatever it is you're doing. So if you, for example, if you know that if you maximize uh, the torque that you get out of uh, no, let's say that you know that you can take an electric engine and you want to take a specific torque out of it with a minimum amount of material. So you're minimizing the weight. But you can turn that into actual value. Right? So how much would that cost you? How much does that reduce uh, the cost of the mass? So that's actual value. And then you can ask the question of how much value am I going to get if I do the simulation or if I do this experiment, I'm going to get this reduction in the economic value of my artifact, and I'm going to have to pay this guy, me for example, this much per hour to do the to set up the simulation and do it, or to set up the experiment and, and do it. Right. So, and perhaps you also have to postpone the decision in order to do that, and that also costs money. And you have to put it there. So I'm not saying it's trivial to do it, right? I'm saying it's a very principle that's actually used in economics. Or it, as you say, it should be used when you're making decisions about uh, business. The value is measured in time or in money, in whatever. Yes, in something that's in of interest to the organization that may, to the, to the monitors. I have one small more question. In slide 26, you use capital letter E. As a function of something, something, something. Yes. Is E the same? Uh, what physical meaning is it? So that would be. Is it just an abstract function or is it physical? So this is the expectation over the, these variables, the psi variables, which are uncertain variables. So this is maximum expectation, which is a function of this. I knew that I shouldn't put any equations in the slides. <laughs> <laughs> I put one and I get a question for it. <laughs> well, so this is one. You have a question. Yes. That's good. You're right. Hey, so, so let's thank the speaker again.